Does the EU, European Union matter to Baltimore? Um, I think it'll prove that it does, but in any case, that's our topic this evening. Uh, we're very honored to have a former Prime Minister of, of Ireland and one who is a gentleman who's very active in European affairs today uh, to be with us. Ambassador Bruton was elected to the Irish Parliament Lower House at the age of 22 in 1969. He served on, as, uh, in various capacities over the years. Uh, a few of them were as leader of the House for a period of time. He served as Minister of Finance on two occasions, uh, Minister of Industry and, and Energy, and Minister of uh, uh, Trade and Tourism. And it was during the time that he was uh, Minister of uh, Industry, I believe, that he, he, he put together most of the legislation uh, uh, for economic change within Ireland, which of course has been such a grand success over the years, and his work at that time uh, in establishing that legislation is a, is a landmark. Uh, in, in more recent years, and of course he was Prime Minister for a period of time during the, the mid-90s, um, he was head of his party prior to that, had, was head of his party from 90, I believe, until 2001. He's been a member of the, the Parliament's uh, Joint Committee on European Affairs since the late 90s and until uh, the acceptance of this position. He also was Vice President of the European People's Party from 97 to 2004. He also was a major figure in the creation of the draft constitution for Europe and before that for the creation of uh, the uh, uh, tools of management of the Euro. Uh, so his career has been, uh, at least when you look at his resume, of two huge parts, the legislative one, and more recently, uh, service uh, to Europe in general. As you all know, he now serves as the head of the delegation of the European Commission in the United States uh, with the position of ambassador. It's my enormous pleasure to present to you Mr. John Bruton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to start, if I may, by complimenting you on memorizing my biography so well. I, I thought you were doing it so effectively that you had to have some sort of auto cue here. <laughs> uh, I think some of the presidential candidates uh, couldn't equal your capacity to retain a lot of data that is ultimately of not great interest. But anyway, thank you very much for your, the professional way in which you succeeded in introducing me. Um, I'm delighted to have this chance to talk here in Baltimore about the European Union and how it's relevant uh, to this city and to this state and to this part of the United States of America. And also to say something about the European Union, how, what it is and what it isn't, what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, the European Union, as you all know, was founded a little over 50 years ago. In the first instance, um, in order to ensure that there would not be a repetition of three successive wars that had been caused by rivalry between France and Germany, the Franco Prussian War, which basically was confined to the French and the Prussians, uh, but the First World War, which was far from being confined to them, and the Second World War, equally destructive of many other peoples of the world. And there was a determination amongst the statesmen of, of Europe that that would never happen again. And the fundamental idea of the European Union uh, is by creating a degree of interdependence between former rivals between France and Germany, that basically these two great powers would be like boxers, boxers in a clinch, that they would be so close to one another that they couldn't swing a punch, or alternatively, so dependent on one another that if they attempted to hurt the other, they would only be hurting themselves. That level of interdependence um, was created between France and Germany through the 1950s and the 1960s. And it was created in considerable measure also because of American leadership. The United States in what must rate as one of the most generous and far-sighted acts in statesmanship in human history through the Marshall Plan decided that you would give substantial amounts of your money or put substantial amounts of your money at risk in order to reconstruct Europe, including reconstructing 
countries who had been in two wars your enemies. But you quite prudently insisted that if you were going to give hard-earned American dollars to perhaps profligate Europeans, that you would insist that the Europeans would spend your dollars well and would not waste them on futile uh, rivalries between them by virtue of creating barriers between their markets. So the idea of creating a common market was in part the result of an American insistence that America get a better bang for its buck, the buck that it was giving freely to Europe. And I think it is important that Americans should have that sense of parenthood of the European Union. In good measure, this union only exists because of your leaders foresight, but also, of course, as I said, because of the wisdom of Europeans. And as time has progressed, this formula of interdependence as a means of avoiding rivalry has been used to finesse other conflicts. I come from Ireland, and those of you who know Ireland well, and I'm sure there are some who do, will know that in the first half, at least, of the last century, and probably for a good time previous to that, Irish people had a bit of a complex about their nearest neighbour. Um, and I think our nearest neighbour had a bit of a complex about us. Um, and that complex, the big and the small, the feeling oppressed and the feeling superior, uh, prevented us basically from dealing with one remaining problem that we needed to resolve together, which is the problem of Northern Ireland. And I would contend that it was only because we both joined the European Union on the same day and suddenly had to work with one another as members of a larger entity where frequently the British found, well, after all, the Irish were quite helpful to them on a particular issue, whether it was a vote in the European Council of Ministers. And the Irish found that, well, the British weren't so bad after all because frequently they had the same interests as we had as an island nation off the mainland. So we got to working together within the European Union. And growing out of that, there came a mutual respect. And growing out of that mutual respect, there came the possibility of dealing with the problem of Northern Ireland. Now, I won't say that membership of the European Union is the only reason. In fact, it's not even the main reason. But it is part of the reason that Britain and Ireland were able to work together in a new context to create the type of arrangement that now is working well in Northern Ireland and creating a mutual respect between the two communities, particularly between their leaders, which previously would have been undreamt of uh, by generations of Irish people going back for at least 300 years or more, 400 years perhaps, to be accurate. Similarly, conflicts that exist, or might have existed, shall we say, between Hungary and its neighbours. Those of you who know the history of that part of Europe will know that there are substantial Hungarian-speaking populations in the countries surrounding Hungary, in Slovakia, in Romania, in Serbia, and in other countries, the result of the Treaty of Versailles. And that could have become a source of conflict between Hungary and its neighbours. But it hasn't become a source of conflict. Because now, Hungary is comparable with the fact that its Hungarian-speaking cousins in other countries are members with Hungary of a larger European Union. And there is some sense of their being together rather than separated by borders. That fundamental idea, that political idea, underlies all that the European Union has been attempting uh, and continues to succeed in doing. The European Union is a body which operates in part by majority voting. When it comes to things to do with building our uh, common market, whether it be setting standards for the goods and services that may be sold across our borders, and you might say it's a ludicrous idea to think that the European Union would be setting standards for lawnmower noise, for example. Well, actually, if you think of it for a while, it makes a lot of sense. 
Because how could you have trade in lawnmowers between the 27 countries of Europe if there wasn't an agreed standard as to what was the permissible level of noise that lawnmowers could emit? So we produce vast amounts of legislation to harmonize or to mutually recognize the different standards we have for goods, for services, so that we will recognize in one country what is the qualification required to be a dentist if one has qualified in another country. Essential if you're to have, as we do, free movement of people within the 27 member states, that we have mutual recognition of qualifications. All that sort of work is done on the basis of majority voting. The other category of work that we uh, do uh, is we try to create a common foreign policy. Sometimes Americans are rather impatient with the European Union in this regard. Understandably, perhaps, because in the case of the United States, foreign policy is decided really by one man or woman, the President of the United States of the day who decides what the policy is going to be, and he or she then proceeds to implement that policy with whatever level of support he or she can obtain from Congress. In the European Union, on the other hand, our foreign policy has to be agreed by unanimous agreement among the 27 member states. So sometimes it can get difficult <laughs> and sticky, not to say slow. But we get there eventually. Because over time, because European ministers of foreign affairs and defense and so on are meeting every month, they gradually get to know what the others think. And even though at the end of the day they know that one of them can say no to everybody else, the habit of simply working together creates an impulse towards a common position. Not as ambitious a position as sometimes the United States might like us to take, but a common position nonetheless a common position that is much more easy for the United States to work with than would be the situation if you had to deal with 27 separate countries, each with entirely separate foreign policy approaches and defense policy approaches. The third area in which we work is in creating a common approach to crime and to fraud across borders. Because clearly, if you create a single market, it can become a single playground for criminal actors of one kind or another. People setting up scams using computers in one country to take money out of bank accounts of another, in another country and transfer that money to a, a bank account belonging to the criminals in a third country. Or likewise, transporting drugs or so on. And in that area, we have had considerable achievements. We now have a single European arrest warrant. We have a single European evidence warrant, whereby evidence collected in one country can be used in courts in another. We have negotiated an extradition treaty with the United States, which will enable us to cooperate more effectively with the United States in dealing with terrorism. We have equally uh, common approaches to the sharing of data with one another about people who might be traveling, who might potentially have the intention of breaking the law. And we're putting in place, we hope, agreements to share that information with the United States. If it wasn't for the existence of the European Union, the United States would have to make 27 different agreements on all these sorts of issues with the 27 member states of the European Union. But by our coming together, we, I think, enable ourselves to use our resources more effectively, but we also make uh, uh, it easier for the United States to achieve the objectives which we have in common with the United States. So that's essentially what the European Union does. It might be worth recalling, although many of you may know this already, though certainly those of you who are specialists will find this part of what I'm about to say boring. But the reality is the United States is in some respects quite similar to the United States and in others very different. It's similar to the United States in the sense that we have a Supreme Court, the Court of Justice, which interprets our constitution, which are our treaties, which are superior to state law. We have a body the Commission, which is a bit like your administration in the sense that it's responsible for the executive activities of the European Union. We have two Houses of Parliament which have to pass our laws. We have the Council of Ministers, which is a bit like the US Senate used to be before the change in the Constitution allowing the direct election of senators. 
And we have the, the European Parliament, which since 1979 is the only multinational directly elected parliament in the entire world. In fact, we could claim to be the only multinational democracy in the world because one of our legislative bodies is directly elected by the people and doesn't go through the governments of the, of the European Union countries. That's where we are similar, but where we're quite different is the European Union can't raise any taxes. Uh, any money it gets has to be raised in taxation by member states. The European Union can't borrow a cent. The United States uh, federal government does occasionally uh, borrow money. <laughs> um, the European Union can't change its constitution without the agreement of every member state, and we've had quite a bit of difficulty lately wanting to change some of our treaties because France and the Netherlands said no. Well, it was quite sufficient if even Malta had said no, it couldn't have gone forward. And we are now heading to a situation towards the end of this year where uh, one country is alone in having a referendum on this. It happens to be Ireland. And if Ireland says no, well, the Constitution can't go into effect, even though all the other 26 countries have said yes. Uh, well, the Reform Treaty, it's now called. But that, that, that's, that's basically an illustration of a difference. And I suppose the other important difference is that a European Union state can leave the European Union. And that's an important thing. Uh, it means that if any country doesn't like what's happening, and, or is so skeptical that it would prefer to be outside, well, it is free, in the words of Jim Reeves' song, to, it's free to go, darling. Mm -hmm. Countries are not obliged to stay in the European Union. And that's an important consideration. It hasn't stopped a large number of countries wanting to join, and nobody has even contemplated leaving. But they are free, ultimately, to do so, which, and everybody knows that. So that means that we operate on a slightly more voluntary basis, shall we say, than the people of South Carolina discovered the United States operated in <laughs> 1861. Likewise, for a country to join the European Union, every one of the existing members must agree. This is actually quite a remarkable thought in a sense. We've gone from six members to nine members to 10 to 15 to 25 and now to 27 at every stage with all the existing members agreeing. And in most cases, the countries that were agreeing were richer than the countries that were coming in. So they were going to have to share their money and see that perhaps their wage levels reduced by competition within the common European labor market for people uh, from lower wage countries. But at every stage, because of our belief uh, in the European idea, the member states have agreed. Now, obviously, there are difficulties with accelerating that too fast, because countries are worrying. Some countries are worried. Some members of the public opinion are worried, for example, about taking in Turkey, which if Turkey becomes in, and we're negotiating that it should, it will become the biggest member of the European Union. On the day it joins, it will be the biggest country in Europe, in the European Union. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there's a, some concern about that among some of the ex existing members of the public. I think there's some concern about it amongst the Turkish public as well. Because even though they are very big, they would still be outvoted within the European Union. So that's, uh, that's one issue that's uh, sort of uh, a difficult one, but I'm sure it will be one that comes up in questions. I find it's the one question that comes up no matter where I go in the United States is about Turkey, and I can elaborate uh, further, uh, further on that. Um, I, I've explained you, to you, as best I can, what the European Union is, what it is, isn't, what it can, and what it can't do. And I suppose I should say something about the importance of the European Union to this great state. Um, well, first of all, I must congratulate the city of Baltimore on the fantastic uh, renewal of this city. I first visited this city in 1970. Uh, it's a long time ago. <laughs> I'm, there's more of me now than there was then. Um, but Baltimore looks uh, a lot better, while I look a lot worse <laughs> than I did in 1970. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's a magnificent uh, credit to the people of this city, that your city is so beautiful. 
and so much an attraction to visitors. And I'm glad to be able to tell you that in the last year, numbers of tourists coming to this city and to this state grew by 13%, and a large number of them were spending euros or pounds sterling, the two big European currencies. Um, the European Union is Maryland's largest export market in the world. Uh, exports to Europe uh, support 44,000 jobs in this state. Um, Maryland exports seven times as much to the European Union as it does to Japan, and seven times as much to the European Union as it does to China, and 17 times as much in case you wanted to know, as you export to South Korea. And 21 times as much as you export to India. Um, and 65% of all the investment coming into Maryland from outside the United States comes from the European Union. In fact, this inward investment supports 85,000 jobs in this state. Um, this is, I think, an enormous evidence of the fact that we depend on you, you depend on us. We own part of you, and you own part of us. Anything that is hurtful to you is hurtful to us. We're bound together, not just by history, not just by common values, but by common interests of the most intimate kind. So it is our responsibility, I think, to ensure that in everything that we do, we act in our own interests. And for the United States, that means acting in concert with Europe. And for the European Union member states, that means acting in concert with the United States. <laughs> we need, clearly, in this very complex world in which we now live, a world that is becoming dramatically more open. Uh, an interesting statistic was quoted by Peter Mandelson, who's the Trade Commissioner of the European Union, in a lecture he gave in, in Cambridge in, in England about three, two weeks ago, where he pointed out that between 1960 and 1990, in that 30-year period, approximately a quarter of the world's population in 1960 were living in what you call open economies that were connected to and that were participating in world trade. And in 1990, approximately a quarter of the world's population were still participating. And 75% were not participating in the open trading system. We're not part of the world economy. However, in 2008, because of the fall of communism, because of the opening up of the Chinese uh, market, because of India abandoning its protectionist approach. We're now in a situation where not 25% of the world's population, but 90% of the world's population are now competing in the, in the marketplace of the world. In a space of 17 years, a huge transformation. And if you wonder why there's problems in Youngstown, Ohio, with steel industries and other industries, it's because where previously they were competing with only 25% of the world's population, they're now competing with 90% of the world's population. That's changed everything. It has created massive potential for beneficial change, but also massive potential for downsides. The upsides have been far greater than the downsides. There's been, in the last 17 years, probably the biggest reduction in world poverty in recent history, in India and in China and in other countries like that. Where in 20 years ago, only one dollar out of every hundred invested overseas went into the poorer countries of the world. Now, 36 dollars out of every hundred is going into these countries that have entered the world market for the first time in the last 17 years. And it hasn't led to a race to the bottom. In fact, in the last number of years, in European countries, and it's true also in this country, there are more jobs, far more jobs than there were in 1990. In Europe, there are 18 million more jobs than there were in 1990. 
And a lot of them are a lot better paid than the jobs that existed in 1990 were. The fact that one has high wages has not prevented Germany or Finland, which have amongst the highest wages in the world, also being amongst the most dynamic exporters uh, in the world. And we sometimes are fearful about China. And um, Peter Mandelson also said something which I thought was interesting. He said, if you treat China as an enemy, don't be surprised if China becomes an enemy. If, on the other hand, you treat China as a partner, you have a reasonable possibility that it will become a partner. And it's a partner in which I think we in the West are probably gaining more from the relationship than are the people in China itself. Take the example of an iPod. An iPod manufactured in China. Now, I don't know how much an iPod would cost. I don't possess one, although my family possesses numerous, <laughs> all of which I've paid for. <laughs> uh, but I'm told, anyway, Peter Mandelson said that, it, uh, Peter, uh, that, that uh, an iPod costs $299. <laughs> I stand corrected, not here. Uh, bless, I'm sure. Um, but he pointed out that only four of those $299 for this iPod that's manufactured in China, only four of those dollars stay in China, whereas 160 of those dollars go to American companies that design the iPod, or have designed it, that transport it, and that retail it. The bulk of the profit from imports coming here from China stay in America. The royalties come back to America. The profit margins are made in America. People are gaining from trade. But obviously, trade has many hazards. The hazard of environmental problems being created as a result of the increased e economic activity. The hazard of dangerous products. The hazard of rapid movements of money in various directions, imprudent lending, imprudent borrowing, mistakes being made by people who are paid large sums not to make mistakes. So we need a system of global rulemaking to ensure that these problems are mitigated, and global supervision of those rules to ensure that the rules are enforced. And I think the start has to be made in giving leadership in the matter of global rules by the two big blocks in the world, the European Union and the United States. Between us, we constitute only 13% of the world's population, but between us, we enjoy 60% of the world's income. So we must make the rules, we must help give leadership, and we must lead by example in these matters. And we need to create confidence in a global system of rulemaking on all of these matters. And we need to do it in a way that gives the general public a sense that they too are involved. And one of the reasons why I'm particularly proud to speak on behalf of the European Union is that possibly the European Union offers a model of how we can reconcile globalization, which is a good thing, from which large Gain has been made by large numbers of people on the one hand, with the other great trend of the early 21st century, more democracy. The problem is that globalization frequently means decisions being made far away from people in which people have no say, and about which they can frequently become very unhappy. In the European Union, as I explained already, we have the only multinational parliament in the world, where a directly elected body representing proportionately the 500 million people of the 27 member states of the European Union participate democratically in approving rules that we make for the 27 member states. Perhaps that can be a model for other great regions of the world, for North America, for South America, for Africa, for the Asian countries to come together to have a democratic system of governance of globalization so that the people who certainly are benefiting financially will also feel they, that they participate democratically in the making of the rules for the world 
of the 21st century in which we will live. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, Ambassador Bruton will call upon you and repeat the questions for the cameras. The question is, um, and it's so precisely put that I'll have to repeat it verb verbatim, there was absolutely no waffle in that question. Um, uh, didn't I say that the European Union is the largest multinational democracy, uh, but are we not simply redefining the nation? Uh, my answer to that would be in the negative. Um, the nations of the European Union still are nations with very clear functions. Everything that, not is, that is not explicitly delegated to the European Union to do remains a function of the 27 member states. Uh, they can leave the European Union, as I explained, so if they don't like the trend, they have the ultimate sovereign right to pull out. Uh, so the nations of Europe remain very much uh, the ingredients uh, which make the European Union work. All the laws of the European Union are enforced not by a European Federal Bureau of Investigation, but by the relevant uh, policing authorities of each of the individual member states, in some cases provinces of member states of the European Union. Uh, indeed, the European Union wouldn't work if the states weren't strong. But equally, we have created an area of law where laws are made that enable us to cooperate fully with one another and have this open market between us. But unlike other areas where such rules exist, and where those rules are made by diplomatic negotiation only, which is mostly taking place in secret, as is the case, for example, within Mercosur or within the North American Free Trade Agreement area, or amongst in ASEAN or other international bodies, in all of those cases, it's diplomatic negotiations taking place in secret that decide what's going to be the rules. In the case of the European Union, while there's an amount of di diplomatic negotiation, there also is, ultimately, the requirement that this be transparently debated by and agreed by a directly elected European Parliament. So we've reconciled the two um, factors rather than created a tension between them, I think. What are the EU positions on growing uh, migration to the European Union from North Africa and growing dependence on energy uh, from uh, Ru the Russian Federation? Both of these are realities. Uh, we do depend on uh, gas, which we get at a good price from the Russians. Uh, they can't use all the gas that they have. Uh, we're quite happy to use it. And it's a good deal for both of us. Uh, however, we don't want to depend on any one source, so we have endeavored to develop a liquid natural gas industry in Europe. We have endeavored to develop gas contracts with North Africa. Algeria, for example, has significant gas supplies as well, which we, we, we import. And we, we endeavor to diversify uh, our energy sources as much as we can. But interestingly enough, uh, energy is one of the areas where each individual member state makes their own policy. We're only beginning to move in the area of having a common policy on energy. Uh, one of the things that will happen uh, if the reform treaty is passed, is that we will have the competence to have a formal energy policy for Europe as a whole, if we can agree on one. And there are tensions, certainly, um, between the countries, some member states having you know, different attitudes, shall we say, to dealing to dependence on Russia than others have. Um, on the issue of migration from North Africa, well, it is fair to say that all of North Africa was, so to speak, colonized by European nations. Well, the British might say that Egypt wasn't actually a colony, but in fact it was controlled by, uh, by, by, by Britain for a good part of uh, its history in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, Libya, as you know, was part of the Italian Empire, briefly. Uh, and for a much longer period, uh, the Maghreb was part of the French Empire. Uh, and people from Europe went to live in those countries, particularly in, in Algeria. So there is a, a connection between uh, those, those two parts of the world and Europe. 
Uh, and we have, particularly in France, uh, a lot of immigration from the, from the Maghreb and the descendants of, of, of migrants from the Maghreb. It's interesting to note that the attitudes towards the West and towards Western ideas amongst Muslims in the world have been the subject of a survey by Pew recently. I don't know if you know the Pew group to surveys. And they show that the most favorable attitudes amongst Muslims surveyed in the world towards the West are found amongst Muslims in France, followed by Muslims in Spain, followed by Muslims in Germany, followed by Muslims in Britain. And then you go on to all the other countries of the Arab world, and the least favorable attitudes, interestingly enough, are not found in the Arab world at all, but in two Muslim non-Arab countries, Turkey and Indonesia. So in fact, the experience of living in Europe has made the majority of the Muslims who've come to live in Europe uh, more in favor of the common values that we, we have. And I think some of them have done very well indeed. The Minister for Justice of France at the present time, the Garde de Céu, uh, she's I think the number three person in France actually, is a, a lady, Rashid Dati of, of, of North African origin. Um, a new political party was founded in Denmark recently, a dramatically successful party that has shot up in the polls and got a lot of seats in the recent general election, headed by a Danish person of, of Muslim origin. Um, Muslims have done very well in the educational system. In, in, there are several members of the, of the British House of Commons who are of Muslim faith. Um, of course, there are other stories. There are stories which have led to terrorism. But, uh, and this has been studied in some detail. And it is, in part, I think, the result of a searching for roots on the part of people. People who don't fit in either back in Pakistan or in Bradford where they're now living. Because while their parents know Pakistan, they only know of it. And they're looking for some way of belonging. And unfortunately, extremism frequently creates that sense of belonging. Uh, I might get into trouble with some people here by saying this, but I think it is true that in the 19th century, the Irish who came to the United States had far more extremist and, to my mind, unrealistic views about what could be done to resolve Ireland's remaining differences with Britain than the Irish in Ireland had. The further you're away from a problem, the more you need, and if you're in an alien country, the more you need to create an identity for yourself that sometimes is projected onto another country, but with quite unrealistic ideas about what's achievable. And I think those sorts of phenomena, that separation, that lack of roots, that difficulty that individuals, particularly young males, have uh, in identifying with themselves with the wider world, do contribute to the tiny minority of young European Muslims who turn to extremist activity. And while we must be absolutely firm in enforcing the law, we must be equally strong in promoting uh, educational initiatives and community initiatives and religious initiatives to make people feel part of the country in which they now live, to make them feel proud of the country, as many French Muslims do feel extremely proud of France. Uh, and France is, I think, probably, it might surprise an audience in this country, probably been the most successful of the European countries in integrating its um, population of North Africa, which is by far the largest, 10% um, uh, of the French population of all of the countries of Europe. Uh, so we're doing pretty well, really, but there are problems. And there will always be problems where you're mixing people of different cultures. But the United States, I think, is an inspiration to all of us as, what, as to what can be achieved when you make the effort. The, the, the question is, is, is there a view in the European Union about admitting to European Union membership countries that are not in Europe? Uh, and the questioner mentions uh, Brazil. Uh, my own sense is that uh, we are a European organization, and only countries that have territory in Europe are eligible 
to become members. As you know, the bulk of the territory of Turkey is not in Europe, but there is part of Turkey that is, and that has made Turkey eligible. Uh, conversely, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, they are, although very close to Europe, no part of their territory is in Europe. So I don't expect that at any time they will be becoming members of the European Union. In fact, we would prefer to encourage them to establish a union of their own uh, in Africa or in North Africa or in whatever region uh, they wish to, to do so. And the same applies to uh, Latin America. However, I, I don't exclude the possibility that as our relationships develop more closely, that we may not want to have common institutions with other entities with whom we're close. There is already, for example, a NATO parliamentary assembly where members of Congress meet with members of all the parliaments of the NATO membership, which include European countries. It's not directly elected for the purpose, uh, but it is you know, a, an example of, 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 of a direction in which you might go, because when the European Parliament was originally established, it wasn't directly elected either. So there may be possibilities of that nature. But I don't think in the narrow sense of the European Union and joining the European Union with all the full um, powers that are intended and the responsibilities that are attendant on that, I, I can't see uh, that going beyond Europe. I personally would be very surprised if the Russian Federation would ever want to join the European Union, even though it's clearly eligible to do so, because uh, the Russian Federation is essentially it's a European Union all of its own. It has several nationalities, the predominant one being Russian, within the Federation, and I expect that they will you know, feel that that's, that's enough of a task for them to undertake. How do we differentiate between the European Union and NATO? Well, we're, we're not, they're not the same countries. Um, for example, Norway is in NATO. It isn't in the European Union uh, as yet. There are a number of countries in the European Union that are not in NATO. Um, Sweden, Ireland, Finland are not in NATO. Uh, however, we are working closer and closer together all the time. The European Union is developing some defensive capacity. There's no European army, but there is a European brigade with a potential strength of 60,000 uh, soldiers that after a certain period could be deployed to deal with certain situations. But it's made clear that for that to work, it has to operate in conjunction with NATO. Um, and in some areas, uh, Europe clearly doesn't have the capacity to do things and has to rely on NATO assets uh, for things that we might want to do. For instance, to move uh, troops from one place to another. Uh, the European Union doesn't have that lift capacity. Uh, it's only by working with NATO and with the US, in fact, through NATO, that we can do that. So there's, a, there's a, an arrangement for cooperation. It's not as close or as good as we would like it to be for a variety of political reasons, some of which are to do with the unresolved dispute over Cyprus, which affects Turkish attitudes to certain things. And, there's a whole lot of stuff that I don't fully understand myself there, but there, there, there is, uh, you know, there, there are, it's, not, it's not a perfect match yet. The question was, has the Irish Republic yet ratified the EU Constitution? Um, the, it's now called the Reform Treaty, which is basically similar in content to the Constitution, has been ratified by most of the member states of the European Union, but Ireland is the only country which is obliged under its constitution before ratifying uh, an EU treaty uh, if, it contain, uh, if it contains any transfer of sovereignty to have that approved by a referendum of the Irish people. Uh, luckily, we're the only country that has that requirement because if every country in Europe had to have a referendum, we would never make any progress in changing EU treaties. Um, but uh, there is, I think, to be a referendum in Ireland at the end of, um, I think it's the end of April or the beginning of May. I'm not quite sure of that. Um, it's not a foregone conclusion that it will pass, but I 
fairly confident that it will. Any of you have any influence in Ireland, I'd urge you to tell <laughs> your cousins to vote yes. <laughs> Do I ever expect Switzerland to join the rest of the world, by which I assume you mean the European Union? Um, uh, Switzerland, as I understand it, um, has a very complicated system, which is even more complex than the Irish system, for approving treaties, and that each of the cantons has to say yes. Uh, and I understand that while I think this is accurate. While German-speaking cantons and Italian-speaking cantons would be happy to join, uh, they've been uh, always a difficulty with French-speaking cantons for some reason. <laughs> Perhaps they don't want to be together with the French in France. I don't know. Um, but in any event, uh, they haven't uh, been able to get a yes to even a close to, to they haven't been able to get much progress towards uh, EU membership, even though many people in that country would like to be in the European Union. What does that mean for Switzerland? Well, in fact, Switzerland has a number of agreements with the European Union, which give them free movement within the European Union. They're able to um, benefit from being at the heart of the European Union, um, but they have no say in the European Union's rules. They have no seats in the European Parliament. They have no Swiss minister sitting at the Council of Ministers when legislation is being passed. But most of the legislation that we pass is pretty sensible stuff anyway. So the Swiss, being sensible people, are quite happy to just implement it in order to be able to benefit from being in the European Union. But in the long run, it's not an ideal situation, I think, for Switzerland, for any self-respecting country to be in a situation where a large part of your laws are being passed by an entity in which you have no democratic say. Uh, but for the time being, I think because of the situation I explained, that's what they have to accept and do accept. The, the questioner asked me for a thumbnail uh, sketch as to how Ireland um, managed uh, to uh, move from a situation where it was one of the poorest uh, countries in the European Union to this questioner suggests having an income per capita that's higher than that of the United States. Um, I charge a very large fee for answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll waive the fee on this occasion. <laughs> um, the, well, first of all, our income per capita is not higher than the United States uh, as yet. It is higher than another important United country that uh, whose title begins with United, which is very close to us. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, why is that the case? I think you could equally ask the question, why did Ireland stay so poor for so long? Why is it that Ireland, which got into independence in 1921, was able to stay out of the Second World War, uh, still found itself in 1960 a lot poorer than a lot of countries that were a lot, that, than which it was a lot rich, richer when it gained its independence, uh, notwithstanding escaping the war. And I think the reason is probably to be found in a basic decision that the Irish people consciously or unconsciously made in the 1920s. Irish people rejected materialism. Uh, the Irish Nationalist Project was a project that glorified rural living, that glorified a certain uh, ethical view of the world, which was founded to a great degree on Catholic social thinking, which regarded materialism as a bad thing, which regarded the accumulation of wealth as not one of the important objectives uh, of policy, and which regarded rejecting, you know, materialism which is associated with godlessness and which is associated with our immediate neighbor uh, <laughs> and creating a, a society that was inward looking but pure. Um, the difficulty with this project was that while the leaders pursued it and sought to restore the Irish language for example, if they had succeeded I don't think there'd be as much American investment in Ireland today because Americans wouldn't be able to speak Gaelic to their workers. But we didn't succeed in this. 
And in somewhere around the 1960s, because so many Irish people simply left the country, people realized that that approach, that protectionist inward looking approach wasn't working, and started to liberalize our economy, encouraging inward investment, investing heavily in education, particularly technological education, uh, investing heavily in, 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 um, in a low tax policy for companies, uh, and producing quite a lot of children who were a bit of a burden in the 1980s because we had to pay for their education, uh, but who reached maturity just at the very time that the information technology revolution was bursting out of the United States, and the United States was looking for IT literate, English speaking people who were ready to work and well educated. And where did they find them? But in Ireland. Ireland has the biggest level of foreign investment apart from Hong Kong in the world, a large part of it is an American investment. Uh, so I think it's, that's the story, at least that's my version. Uh, 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 of the story. It's a story of a century of two halves. The first half of the century in which the priorities were different. And who is to say, if we weren't to come back in a hundred years' time, that people might not say that the priorities of the first half of the century were the right priorities, that all this mad rush for wealth is actually rather self-defeating. Who knows? But anyway, we opted from about 1960 on for uh, the materialist path, and we've been quite successful at it. The questioner is asking me to contrast the EU uh, treaties, which are our constitution, which are, is a very long series of documents, with the American constitution, which is a short document. Um, why is there this difference? Well, historically, I think there is a difference between the civil law or Roman law countries of the continental Europe and the common law countries. The countries of continental Europe have a tendency to write the rules down in detail, whereas the countries of the common law have the idea of having general principles and allowing the courts to interpret those general principles. Um, which is the better approach? You can argue, argue either way. There are many in this country who, for example, feel that your constitution gives too much latitude to your judges, or that your judges have taken too much latitude in interpreting the constitution. On the other hand, given how difficult it is to amend the US constitution, it's hard to see how certain problems might have been dealt with if judges were not willing to make quite imaginative leaps, shall we say, interpreting what the founders might have meant if they lived in a different era to the one in which they in fact lived. Um, that sort of creativity is necessary in the EU system. We have our judges uh, of the European Court of Justice, but they are interpreting much more precise and much more voluminous texts, uh, and therefore there's less margin. And I think given that we're 27 different nations with 27 different traditions, it's probably more sensible for us at least to have a more detailed document because we don't trust one another, maybe, as much <laughs> as Americans you know, have fought so hard to come to trust one another eventually, if you know what I mean, after a long period of differences. Um, so, you know, and you have a longer history, basically, together. Uh, maybe, at, you know, at some point in the future, we'll be able to have a short constitution like yours when we really all, you know, completely have confidence in one another. But, you know, we haven't got there yet. The question uh, is about why Britain isn't in the Euro. Um, the official position of the British government and of the then Chancellor, now Prime Minister, I think, was that five economic tests had to be met for Britain to decide to join the European Union, uh, to join the Euro. Now, these tests were quite <coughs> general, um, and it was deemed that they hadn't been passed. Um, so officially, the argument is economic. I think in practice, it is, as you suggested in your question, more a political one, that uh, Britain believes that uh, its Bank of England, which is a British institution, should be determining the uh, currency policy of a British currency, and that 
issues concerning currency policy and interest rate policy are so important that they should be decided by each member state on its own, or at least by Britain on its own for Britain. Um, I think it is fair to say that Britain hasn't, on the face of it, suffered greatly from not being in the euro. Uh, Britain's economic growth rates have been at least as good as the growth rates of the euro countries. Is that because Britain has a separate currency? I think not. I think that's because of the reforms that were made previously by Mrs. Thatcher and uh, others, which have yielded considerable benefits, and that those are the reasons for Britain doing well now, rather than the fact that it has a separate currency. Um, Britain does have a slightly higher interest rate than we do in Ireland and the other Euro member countries have. So it, it could be argued that it's paying a slight price for being outside, but it's quite, the difference is only not, I think, one percentage point or less. It's not very significant. For the smaller countries of the European Union, being in the Euro has made a huge amount of sense. Uh, Britain is big enough to be able, usually, to, be a, to withstand speculation against its currency. Now, there was one famous occasion when it didn't withstand it, but generally it's a big enough currency and the resources of the government and the country are big enough to be able to weather storms on the currency markets. But for a small country uh, to be out on its own with its own currency to defend can be very destabilizing. And I know that in Ireland's case, for instance, in 1993, uh, interest rates shot up to some enormous overnight rate as the government tried unsuccessfully to defend the Irish pound against speculation. Now that we're in the euro, that can't happen to us because we have the weight of Germany and the weight of France and the weight of Italy and the weight of Spain and all those other countries standing behind our currency. And that you know, makes a lot of difference. For Britain, that's more of a choice. They don't have to. Uh, and I think those are, 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 are the reasons. If you were to ask me the supplementary question, do I expect Britain to join the euro soon? My answer would be no, I don't. Um, would I like them to join? My answer would be yes, but is it critical and urgent? No. For a, uh, a very informative, interesting, and I think thoroughly enjoyable evening, we thank you very much. Thank you.